Okay, hi, uh, welcome everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Haina Kabiro, and I am part of the East of Scotland chapter who organized this session today. Uh, we will talk about sustainable water management, which I think is not only a really interesting topic, but it's also very current. Um, I hope that none of you experienced firsthand uh, flooding that was happening across the country a couple of weeks ago, but I think it really highlights what an enormous challenge it is for cities to deal with access water. Uh, and the objective for today is to take away some ideas about how we can manage this better through nature-based solutions. In terms of the format, we are having uh, two presentations today and a Q&A at the end. All you really need to know in the meantime is to please have your microphones uh, muted if you don't already. Um, and there's a chat box on the right hand side of the screen where you can type in comments and ask questions. And uh, after the presentations, I will try to pick up as many of these as possible. If you run out of time, we will also take these questions afterwards and uh, you will be able to check our responses and re-watch the recording. Uh, so you're aware as well the session is being recorded. Uh, I hope you're all okay with that. So without any further delay, our first speaker today is David Winter from Scottish Water. So over to you, David, um, and please share your screen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just before I start into my slides, of, of which there are around uh, 15, so I'm not going to keep you keep you too long. Uh, I'm David Winter. I'm a, I'm a technical team leader working for Scottish Water, in particular the asset strategy part of Scottish Water. So my role is to do is to look after, develop, implement the the long term strategies for the sewer network, the collection network. Uh, the, the dominant part of the work just now, though, is on our stormwater management strategy, which uh, is a nice introduction to my to my slides, because um, that's kind of where we where we start. So, um, from a Scottish water point of view, um, this is an example of the current challenge that we and, and, and our stakeholders have got. Um, this is uh, external flooding, which is bad enough. Uh, even worse than that, many more times worse than that, is internal flooding. And that's our, that's our biggest challenge as a water company just now in terms of the, the wastewater side of the business. Uh, uh, and, and bad, as, bad enough as it is in, in, the, in, the, in current days, um, what we are definitely seeing is, the, is a substantial future challenge. And that kind of comes uh, in, in, in three parts of the future uh, increase in pressure on the network. Uh, the first is new development, on, on shown on the left-hand side here. Typically, we see that type of development uh, being added on to our network, added on to the urban areas. Um, we see lots of road space, lots of roof space, and increasingly minimal green space introduced into new into new development. That, that adds pressure to the network. Secondly, uh, a term which is, I guess, an industry term, you may be familiar with it, but urban creep. And I, and I guess there's no better way of describing what it is than looking at those two images that are cycling around there. So urban creep is essentially the loss of green space in an existing urban developed area. So we see there green gardens, borders being paved over. That adds greatly to the pressure uh, on the sewer network because it increases the amount and the speed of, of rainfall runoff into the sewers and other drainage systems. And finally, climate change, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, predictions for climate change for 2050. I'm not even sure these are up to date numbers, but however, it doesn't need to be up to date to let you see that that is a significant uplift on rainfall that we're having to plan for for 2050. And again, another significant uplift beyond that. So in terms of long-term planning, that's a significant challenge on the network. So uh, at Scottish Water, we, we, we kind of looked ahead at our, our needs for the sewer network and we said, OK, so we, we need to do something different here. So we, we developed and we are now implementing a stormwater management strategy. So a, a brief bit of information about that. Um, so what we want to do is to prevent new stormwater, uh, surface water from entering the existing combined sewer network. 
that's essentially a, a matter of managing new development better. Indeed, we we went of we have gone as far as essentially having a policy that says new developments cannot now connect new stormwater into existing combined sewers. They need to look for an alternative route for that. Um, now, following that route, that alternative is is essentially good management practice for stormwater. It's what we should be doing anyway. All we've really done is put a policy in place to say we'll be enforcing that, we'll be looking for developers and planners to do better around that. The more significant issue though is the remove or and or reduce the existing stormwater in the combined sewer network from preventing it from entering. So that's really addressing the, the retrofit of surface measures in the urban environment, um, looking to reduce the pressure on the existing combined sewers by managing rainfall in the urban environment in a different way. And we aim to do that whilst we continue to support economic growth for stakeholders. So essentially, we're, we're not going to prevent develop from, development from happening. happening. We're, we're just going to probably look for it to be done in a different way. A, 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 a bit of a strap line for the strategy is essentially no more in uh, and what's in out. Um, it has become memorable in Scottish water. Maybe it will stick with you after after today a little bit, um, but it's essentially saying no more in, no more new development flows, and what's in there in terms of existing flows to combine sewers, we want to take that out. And a little bit of an idea about how we want to do that. Um, so the the grey to green, as we've indicated on the bottom there, is showing that up till now, and predominantly still the case. To manage the pressures on the network, we build grey things and essentially grey things under the ground. So we build big tanks, big pipes, lots of buried infrastructure, and uh, we, we increase the capacity of the network. What we want to move to sometime in the future, starting now, is to um, de deploy more green measures and therefore measures that are on the surface to manage manage the stress on the network. So a little bit about um, uh, 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 how drainage systems work effectively. Now, forgive me if, if this is all very, very familiar to you, but it's a little bit of a lesson in the basics. So we kind of refer to major and minor drainage systems. Uh, let's start with a major drainage system. That's, that's essentially both the formal and I guess the informal flow paths, routes, water courses, roads, channels, canals, etc. That, that, that rainfall, when it's falling in extreme amounts, will find, uh, either by design or, or, or otherwise, that's the route that the flow will pass through an urban area. Um, that, that's how it will pass through effectively in the major drainage system. The minor drainage system is the drainage networks. The, the, the formal piped networks can include the sewers and other drainage systems connected by downpipes from the roofs. Uh, and conveys the flow away in normal rainfall and, of course, in dry weather. So major and minor drainage systems, they interact with each other, and that's when things can become a little bit tricky. Um, that's when flooding, which includes sewer flooding, can be derived. Uh, and so we're looking to understand how these drainage systems interact. Uh, you don't have to go too many years back from today, and all that the all that companies like Scottish Water would be looking at would be the minor drainage systems. They would, in essence, ignore the major drainage systems. That's no longer a sustainable point of view. So uh, I mentioned some of the, the grey buried traditional solutions. That we, we refer to them as traditional because that's what we've always tended to do. Uh, so these things represent the minor drainage system. Now, they don't look like minor assets to me, but it, it's the minor drainage systems. They are significant cost, significant disruption to build, arguably not sustainable either. Um, for the long term, at some point, given the pressures of climate change, the capacity of those, those things may well be defeated if we don't get our planning right. What we're trying to look to do under the strategy instead is to, is to do this ourselves and to encourage other people to, to look at the blue-green infrastructure 
And these include, you know, collectively you could just call them SUDs, but essentially it's stormwater management devices. Um, and there's array, an array of them there, and, and, and maybe you're familiar with them. Uh, maybe you should get more familiar with them as, as planners if, if that's not the case. So we're looking for these things to be used both in the new development arena and in existing urban retrofit arena to manage storm flow on the surface before it's allowed, if it needs to be allowed, to drop into the sewer network. Um, these, these things are, are, uh, are fine. They're, 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 they're good assets at managing stormwater. But I think the thing that we also see, which is uh, well, appeal, appeal to planners and other stakeholders, is that they're essentially a multifunctional landscape. So they do, uh, and I'm sure this is coming into an area that you're more familiar with, they, they do provide placemaking, climate adaptation, biodiversity, improved environment, social and community um, cohesion uh, and, uh, and health and well-being aspects. Those are some of the multiple benefits that could be gained by, by uh, uh, managing stormwater with these. And these are benefits that we as a, as a water company are starting to evaluate in our projects and will eventually begin to make decisions on in our projects. So it won't simply be, does it solve the flooding? Yes. Is it the cheapest capital? Yes. That's, that's, we're looking at the other benefits in terms of decision making in our, our investment programs. So um, we can go from a problem like that, an extensive sewer flooding issue here, uh, and you can see the sewer, sewer flooding from the sewer, uh, the flooding from the sewer manhole there. This problem is, is also a, a matter of overland flow flooding. So we are working with the local authority there to work together tackling the minor and the major drainage systems to try and resolve this flooding. And so we want to look at this problem, and indeed we are looking at this problem by looking at the, at the adjacent space. And we are saying, what if we change that space into something like this to manage the stormwater? Could we address that flood risk by implementing something that, and that, bear in mind, this is just a conceptual design, could we use that space differently from its its current use, manage the stormwater, and add to the the local community there? And and to do that, we we started working with stakeholders. Um, so this that particular project you see is is in Dundee, uh, and we uh, we at the you know before lockdown and the pandemic came across came along we we got in a room with multiple stakeholders across local authorities uh, our own people other stakeholders including our environmental regulators and uh, snh and we thought through what we might like to see as as co-benefits if we work together in this catchment and where we could achieve those and, and some of the images there show how that day went and what it produced uh, and essentially, we we got into the, the into the way of collaborative planning. Since then, we've kind of had to move that same planning thoughts and processes online, and and we're beginning to develop techniques where we can do this remotely um, and start to gather the needs and the opportunities. In, in this example, across the whole city, in terms of identifying what can we do in the whole city to manage stormwater, and we're beginning to work together with other stakeholders now to look at the whole stormwater management approach with in mind the, 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 the method we'd like to deploy first being you know natural uh, um, surface featured interventions like like suds features and that that brings us to a, 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 a probably a, a, an example in in Perth. Uh, so Perth approached us with a, a, the Dunkeld Road Active Travel Corridor, uh, and we were quite quickly able to think and and say, well, yes, I think we do have opportunity to work together here. Uh, there are some, as this slide uh, in uh, kind of a, in a little bit of detail explains a little bit about the the potential opportunities for stormwater management to be part of the integrated design of the of the active travel route hence we get some benefit out of taking part into into the in the co-planning at the same time as active travel is delivered and, and i'm sure other benefits are delivered also um, and i think that concludes thank you
Okay, thank you very much, David. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. This is a really good overview and I think it's very positive that Scottish Water um, is so proactive about the transformation from grey to green and that you're already working with a number of local authorities and other partners uh, to make it happen. So from uh, your presentation, uh, we would like to start ours now with my colleague Douglas Cook. Jenny, if you could help me share my slides, please. Okay, um, so my colleague Doug, uh, he is a landscape uh, architect and he's got over 20 years of experience with the field um, and he's worked in a variety of projects including housing, uh, wind farm schemes, town centre regeneration and community-based projects and he's really interested in seeing how we could work better collaboratively and engage with communities um, to develop um, nature-based solutions and design with nature better. As for me, uh, I am a planning officer. I graduated three years ago from Danny University and have been working with Perth and Kinross Council since then. And I specialize in areas including placemaking, green infrastructure and drainage. And Doug and I uh, took on a project last year. We worked uh, to develop a new planning guidance for open space design and maintenance. And it was uh, as part of this project that we dug a little deeper into why sustainable uh, urban drainage systems aren't too common in our area. Um, I don't seem to be able to change my slide, Jenny. Apologies for this. Um, here we go. Um, yes, yeah, so one of the problems that we observed while we were talking to people and looking at schemes that we are getting uh, is that where SUDs are overlooked in the design process, they can um, they can end up being monofunctional, isolated and unattractive. And this uh, example on the left hand side, are, I marked for you the green areas and the suds basins in blue. So you can see that they don't really form a network. They don't really create blue and green infrastructure that would really deliver these multiple benefits. And uh, when you see what's actually being delivered on site, I would argue that that's not particularly attractive either. You don't see different plants. Uh, it's not biodiverse. It may be perfectly functional for flood water management, but as uh, David was saying, that uh, their, their potential is far greater than that. So what we're trying to achieve instead of these is uh, this multifunctional concept in landscape design. And I give full credit to my colleague Doug for this great comparison uh, of, a, of a camper van and basically saying that, um, you know, the same space in an urban area or in a camper van should have uh, multiple features. It should be uh, well integrated, it should be diverse. So while the one on the left hand side may take you from A to B, the one on the right, you can cook in it, relax in it. Uh, and it's the same with SUDs. Uh, besides controlling flood water and improving water quality, they should also be um, a feature in the landscape, a central point for the community. And they should create habitats for biodiversity. So our aim is to focus on these four pillars more equally and to use um, these versatile features in our parks, on our streets, um, within our schools and make sure that they are well integrated with public open spaces so we can all benefit from them. And you see here um, some positive examples of how SUDs can look like when they are designed well. And you see that they create a really diverse and dynamic living landscape uh, that facilitate the interaction between people and nature, that create a sense of place and a focal point in the neighborhood. And when you design them well, they can really be artistic um, and look very attractive. 
So this all sounds great, um, but we wanted to understand why this isn't common practice yet. So last year we organized two workshops with key partners who have uh, a stake in the design or the maintenance of SUDs. And we were basically asking, what do you think are the barriers to creating these features and what would be the solutions? Uh, some of the main issues that were highlighted were in relation to maintenance. So obviously when you design uh, an attractive feature like this, you want to make sure that it stays that way 5, 10, 20 years down the line. And this can be difficult with uh, budgetary constraints, with the lack or negative past experiences, and then maybe a little pushback to some of the more creative solutions because of this. Um, from the development industry, we were hearing concerns uh, about land take. And when we talked to designers, they said they would love to create um, ponds and swales in neighborhoods, but they obviously take up quite a lot of space. And this way they compete with the developable area of sites. It was also flagged up that sometimes uh, expectations quite, can be quite um, unclear and complicated. It's a complex topic with many actors in the process, including planners, engineers, uh, maintenance companies, and everybody looks at it from a bit different perspective and maybe have um, some conflicting expectations. So um, for a designer, it can be quite difficult to meet all of these and maybe they just end up focusing on the very basics and miss out um, on the opportunities. So when we discuss potential solutions, uh, something we all agreed on is that SUD should really be considered uh, in the master planning process early on. And when, when you have a site, it's a blank canvas, and probably the first things you start thinking about is your access, uh, your roads, your grey infrastructure. But really, you should also think about how water flows through the site, where are the opportunities to connect um, green features to blue, and create this integrated landscape that can also help you with your land tech because within one area you're accommodating a lot of the functions that you will need within your site. The other thing that came through is that we have to collaborate better. This is a list of the organizations and teams within the council who took part on our workshops last year and I think um, as we talked to each other and got more familiar with each other's uh, perspectives, we really became more aware and more committed to making these positive changes happen. Um, and certainly from our perspective at Perth and Kinross Council, I think we are working towards giving better um, and more streamlined advice to developers, which is obviously really important. What um, this collaboration also means for us in practice, we are working towards a joint agreement for the maintenance of SUDs between Scottish Water and the Council. And we are hoping that by both of us, both our organisations having a stake in the design process, we will work um, better together. And at the planning application stage, we would like to look at issues and opportunities earlier on. So that is to identify any problems that could come up later on that could mean a problem in maintenance. Um, and this is to make sure that the design doesn't have to change after planning permission um, has been granted. And there is also an opportunity, and I think this is important, to promote soft objectives uh, within technical guidance. Sometimes um, I think engineering requirements and technical requirements can come through very strongly and that's what people focus on. And it is easy to miss um, that biodiversity potential. So in terms of the planting or um, the creativity of integrating water features into public parks and we should focus on that equally not only within um, housing schemes or parks, but also when we design our streets. So to tie in this um, with roads design and roads design guidance. And finally, uh, something that Doug will talk about later on in more detail and David has also mentioned, um, we should work on projects together because they're a great opportunity to demonstrate possibilities and to test ideas. And we've got a couple of these uh, coming up in Perth. 
And lastly, under collaboration, I think it's crucial to look at the teams which are working on this project and make sure that um, we've got all the necessary expertise from an ecologist to a landscape architect to a planner and uh, to engineers, and obviously to include the local community um, in the decisions and the design decisions that you make, because really this is the only way to achieve um, a successful multifunctional landscapes. So after talking about best practice through master planning and collaboration, I will now hand over to my colleague Doug, and he will talk you through some of the site-specific design solutions that we came up with um, and that we promote in our guidance to address common issues. So over to you, Doug. Thanks, Angie. Um, <clears throat> can everyone see my screen okay? Uh... I'm going to discuss the integration of SUDs into the landscape, and I'll round up with summarising two schemes in Perth and Ross. With the camper van analogy in mind, incorporating SUDs into the multi-purpose landscape creates opportunity and a resource that adds value to the community whilst fulfilling, um, fulfilling a number of functions. In this first slide, the swales and retention areas have a dual function, surface water collection and dispersal, and planting. The combination is also known as rain gardens or bioretention bio areas. The basic pr principle behind this, behind the rain garden, is that it's located in a shallow depression and it collects the surface water. The full volume of the planting substrate or the soil acts like a reservoir to hold the water until it slowly dissipates. And that can be through a combination of through the ground, through surface evaporation, absorption by the plants and also evaporation through the plant leaves themselves. And this is a multi and as this is a multi-purpose approach, the planting also has a function. For example, it could provide landscape structure, screening, immunity value, and habitat, to name a few. The three considerations for a successful rain garden is soil type, planting, and maintenance. The most important aspect is the soil. It provides the foundation to the system, and if this fails, the whole system fails. It needs to be a free, it needs to be free draining so that the planting area acts as a reservoir to contain the water. If, for instance, the soil was clay-based, the water would just sit on the surface and the substrate would not absorb the whole uh, would not absorb uh, the water, and the, and the whole planting area will have a reduced water retention capacity. Another consideration is the soil and the subsoil condition of the surrounding land. For instance, if, if, the, if, the, if this was within a building site, there's a high chance that the ground would be compacted. And this will reduce the land's ability to absorb surface runoff and also the water from the swales. The soil within the rain garden itself should also be of low nutrients, and this would help suppress weed growth and help to reduce maintenance as well. The planting itself also needs to contain species which are tolerant of both wet and dry conditions, as a well-drained soil will retain little moisture during dry periods. If we look at uh, this example uh, showing a retention basin incorporated into an immunity space. It, <clears throat> when, we're, when we're incorporating a water body into an immunity area, it needs to be considered how it will be used by the community, especially when we think of children. This brings in the question of water safety, and each local authority will have their own guidance on risk assessments for this. However, many hazards can be reduced through design, such as reducing the gradients of bankings and the depth of the water around the edges of the pond. This example shows a shallow retention basin with, it, with an overflow into the wider green space. This is based on the theory that a conventional basin would not be at 100% capacity at all times, and therefore the surrounding landscape could be designed to be resilient and accommodate occasional flooding. Slopes into the basin, particularly on the park side, could have a shallow gradient, and this is for three reasons. Ease of access and egress. Shallow slopes provide broader marginal areas for habitat creations, which also provide a buffer between the main water body and the immunity space. And there is also easier access for maintenance purposes as well. Wildflowers, 
areas can also be incorporated. And here on this diagram, we've shown them on slopes to help, and the aim there is to help reduce mowing, where they also create buffer zones and habitat. In addition, the topsoil in these areas could be replaced with an open grade soil with a higher water absorption capacity. And to help again with the maintenance, native shrubs and tree plantings are shown on steeper slopes where mowing and frequent maintenance may be difficult. At the top side of the, the diagram, there is a play area which is shown on, raised, on some raised ground. In Perth and Kinross, many of our parks are prone to flooding and we design a number of our play areas on low mounds. So when there's a time of flood, what we have are, are small islands appearing within a watery landscape and the equipment and safety surfacing remains untouched by the flood water. The access track around the perimeter of the site is for maintenance vehicles. And in this, in this uh, here it is shown as, uh, as a green track system to help it blend with the immunity space. But there's also potential here to be able to construct it with an open grade material that could act as a linear soak away in its own right. Another concept is to scale up the rain garden approach and incorporate, into, incorporate swales or basins within woodland structures. For this to work, the tree species would need to be tolerant to both wet conditions. So species like willow and alder would be ideal and a natural landscape such as karst woodland could be mimicked. In addition, marginal planting and wildflower could be incorporated to create buffer zones between the immunity space and the woodland. Where, tight, <coughs> where space is tight, there may be a need to incorporate suds onto sloping grounds. In this example, a series of terraced ponds are constructed into the slope and interwoven with structural and marginal planting to help reduce visual impacts and to tie the, the framework into the wider landscape. The availability of storage of water provides a dynamic force for change in it within any landscape setting. It replicates natural water systems such as the one shown in the top left photo, which shows a series of interconnecting ponds when water levels are low. And this changes into a single larger water body as the water levels increase. This could be used to our advantage to create interest and variety within the landscape setting of any development. The photo and the sketch to the right demonstrate how this approach could be incorporated into our designed landscape. As you mentioned, space is always a premium on any site and the creative integration of sides in tight spaces may be required. One approach could be the use of linear blue-green corridors that weave through or along the edges within the development, such as the one shown here, where the channels can be made into features or focal points and localized flooding is made into a positive asset. And these, exa these examples show dry river beds, which can be, become water channels and cascades at times of floods. Linear rain gardens can be incorporated into the street design to collect roof runoff <clears throat> Linear retention ponds can become watercourses. The bottom, the picture in the bottom right corner shows clearly shows the sort of dished profile of the of the drainage channel to or the green blue corridor to accommodate uh, flooding. The interaction with water and seasonality also gives rise to the opportunity to create art form within the landscape. Here we see serpentine features and the use of different materials to create interest. But also practical on the convention, uh, conveyance of water. The serpentine shapes and the use of irregular surface materials also has a practical use by reducing the velocity of the water runoff and also increases the opportunity for evaporation. The swimming, the swimming pond in the top right is probably a more extreme, but it shows another potential use, perhaps more appropriate to a domestic setting. 
these have been some of the ideas and solutions that we have been looking at and working towards in Path to Ross. As uh, Hajani mentioned before, we have a, a few live projects in progress which will allow us to test these ideas in practice. We're hoping that by demonstrating how we can implement these successfully, we can encourage others to use them more frequently in new housing and regeneration schemes. As, uh, as David mentioned earlier on, um, one of the, mo one of the most pro uh, major schemes in Perth at the moment is the Dunkeld Road Corridor. This is the main route into Perth from the north. It contains sections of multi-lane carriageway and currently forms a psychological barrier through the north-eastern part of Perth. The slide shows the existing corridor dominated by multi-lane roads and an artist's impression of how it could become a more vibrant and more multifunctional space. The original concept behind this proposal is to free up existing road space and make it available for active travel, integrate the corridor into the neighbouring communities, create more attractive places for people and introduce greenery. However, as uh, David mentioned earlier on, the concept behind the project develops and it becomes obvious that there are golden opportunities to both combine projects from different sectors within the council, develop an area, develop an area-wide master plan and develop a collaborative approach for other agencies such as Scottish Water. And this also brings benefits, bring a wide range of skill sets and experience to the project, having a common goal that everyone can buy into, opportunity to learn from other disciplines and to increase the skills base. It produces a project that is attracted to funders, there are cost savings and it creates a diversity in streetscape and community. This slide also shows the central part of the corridor and Scottish Water's interest in the area. And as David mentioned, there are opportunities to incorporate suds across the whole area, open up culverted water courses, improving green spaces, introducing greenery into the streets, as well as improving actual drainage in the area. Also within this area are several Perth and Kinross projects, including improvements to the town laid, side streets and school playgrounds. It makes sense to master plan everything together to create a blue-green network with a, with a holistic approach and thus the opportunity to make a much larger and more positive impact on the northeast corner of Perth. Within the Dunkeld Corridor are a number of schools where there's potential to break out the hard standing and introduce green spaces with sud elements and educational facilities or features such as these shown in this example of Stebbin Heath Primary School in Wales. To finish off this part of the presentation, I'd like to show this final example. It's a community-led project in Kinross, which is a small town located to the south of Perth. The project is called Kinross Rain Garden Challenge, and the with the key aim to introduce 20 rain gardens of varying size into the settlement. The, proposal, the proposals range in scale from swales accommodating runoff from roads and properties through to small scale options of water runoff from roofs and gardens. The objective is to demonstrate that small scale and simple interventions can play a large part in the collection of surface water and pollutants and showing that rain gardens have a have more storage potential than the conventional gullies and pipes. In addition to the science behind the rain gardens, they also provide amenity value by adding greenery and potential habitat into the street, softening the harshness of our urban streets, which are often devoid of plants. To sum up, sites provide opportunities and a force for change in the landscape and revitalizes our approach to how we design landscapes as a whole. And this brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you very much for that, Doug. Um, I hope that you found the two uh, presentations interesting. Firstly, from um, a Scottish water point of view from David, uh, and secondly, about how we try to work towards best practice in Perth and Kinross. 
And we still got about 20 minutes uh, for questions and we've got a few here. And so I will just start reading them up, but feel free to add more to the box while we are going through them. So first question is from Andrew. Andrew, I will take your question in two parts. Um, the first one is, we are encouraged by Scottish water considering multifunctional suds. What will this translate to formal adoption? David, would you like to take this one? David, can you uh, make sure that your microphone is switched Sorry, on? Sorry, yeah, school, school boy. <laughs> okay, so straight to Sewers for Scotland issue there. Um, okay, so we, we are openly saying uh, Sewers for Scotland doesn't fit the bill for what we're what I've shown you in the stormwater management strategy there. It's actually part of the strategy to look at Sewers for Scotland again, and to uh, and we we in Scottish Water have the intention to open uh, Sewers for Scotland out, open it out a bit, so that we will consider a wider range of, of SUDs. Uh, we probably can't look at every potential SUDs you would want to use as a, as a vestible asset, but we are intending to show willing to look at a, a wider range. Um, uh, indeed, if you started to offer those things now, we would probably look at them now in lieu of a, 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 a version of Sewers of Scotland that contains that. So um, I, I think I would uh, possibly encourage you to, to ask us if we would, even though it might not on paper fit the bill. I, I, I don't know if that addresses the question adequately. Hopefully it does. Yeah, I would uh, like to add that um, to this, that when we had the workshops last year, um, there were uh, a lot of people who were raising this issue, and that's why uh, one of our suggestions was to have a joint agreement for the maintenance, the formal adoption of assets. Um, and the way that would work in our case is that the council would maintain above ground elements and Scottish Water would maintain underground um, and hopefully by starting these conversations early on in the planning process um, that would allow for having these discussions and accepting more creative solutions because mm -hmm. um, yes Andrew I think if if you come up with something unconventional and then you just put it straight up for adoption it might not get a positive feedback but I think definitely um, there's uh, there's an attitude there's an appetite for change here yeah, the I'm, second I'm, question that Andrew, sorry, actually, sorry. I'll maybe make a, make a couple other points there I, I think uh, uh, you, you need to be aware that implementing the stormwater strategy, implementing a different way of thinking about managing stormwater uh, is something that is work in progress internally in Scottish Water. So if you were to contact some people in, in development services team, let's say tomorrow, uh, they might not be on, on message with that yet. Uh, it's going to take time to push that message right down through the business. There are a lot of people to get through. It'll take time. So, you know, be patient with us. The other thing I might add, though, is that I don't think Sewers of Scotland should be seen as a barrier to do this kind of thing. Um, there are examples, and I think there are probably examples in Perth, where uh, these things have been done well and have not required to be vested in Scottish water. So that, that is an option, probably around new development, of course, um, but there is an option to do the right thing with SUDs. Uh, they don't have to be vested. They only have to meet a standard if you want them to be vested. Um, so we, we, you should not see Sewers for Scotland as the barrier to do the right thing. Uh, so please bear that in mind. Thank you very much, David. Um, the next question uh, from Andrew and then Stephanie had a similar one. So I'm gonna read them together. Um, is around health and safety risk. Uh, so no more fences for supposed health health and safety risks um, and in respect of barriers to more versatile solutions to SUDs, did you encounter key partners referencing safety as being a barrier to creation of nature ponds? This has been used as a reason to resist this type of nature-based solution in the LPA I work for. Um, definitely when we were working 
working on the design guidance, this was one of the key, key um, questions, but we all agreed that um, high fences all around ponds and basins is, is definitely, it can be the way forward. And instead, we would really like to see um, either shallow gradients used, where, which don't pose a safety risk, structure planting, use this barrier, as uh, Doug was also mentioning, rather than fencing. And if it is absolutely necessary to have a fence, then it should be low level and made of sympathetic materials. But I would say that if you um, if you look at well-designed salt schemes, the water is quite open and, and people just have that sort of awareness um, of obviously how to how to approach it and it shouldn't mean a problem if it is well designed but I'm aware that this can be it can also take time to change this uh, perception of safety hazards I don't know if David or Doug has anything to add to that I, I think um, I think people forget that the the fe fence around the water body is also a hazard and not necessary it, not necessary uh, a way of just preventing people to access the water, but it also prevents people from accessing the water to rescue someone or a child who may be in distress on the other side. So it's both a deterrent and, and a hazard at the same time, and that has to be bared in mind uh, when they're going through the design process, uh, design risk assessments as well. Yeah, it's a very individual point of view, health and safety. The, 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 there's there's always arguments in, on both sides. Um, I, I've seen I, I had some feedback from a, a well-established suds feature in, in Dundee, uh, uh, you know, a permanent pond type feature that did have a fence around it from day one. It's been there a long time uh, and some feedback from residents is that they would like this to see the fence taken away because it actually detracts from the from the feature, so it, it, it works all ways, I guess. But uh, I think, as, as you mentioned, um, uh, it can be made safe with measures other than a fence, I, I think, is the, is the point can be made. But uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was okay, just thinking thank of you very one. much, Paul. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Doug. Sorry. All right, sorry. Um, yeah, I was just thinking of one particular such pond I was looking at with, at the weekend with my children, who are avid uh, pond dippers. Um, one end of the pond is a very deep pond, and one end has a very sharp drop from the access track straight into the water, and there's a very minimal marginal area where it just plummets straight down in the deep water. And I'm looking at that think, as a parent, thinking, I'm not letting my children near that. But meanwhile, one of my kids had escaped and gone round the side of the pond and were accessing it from another side. And at that end, there was a much more gradual slope into the into the pond. The water was a lot shallower and there was a larger marginal planted area as well. And he was able to get into the pond there and safely access the water. So it just shows that even within one pond, you can have different a different sort of set of safety almost just, pure, just through the, the design of the pond itself. And as a parent, being in a shallow water, a bit of marginal planting is great, um, but don't really want the, the sharp drop into the water. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so I think that was that was all about safety. Uh, the next question from Sue um, is presumably this design will require refurbishment periodically to prevent silting up of the porous soil, soil layer. I think Doug is this is probably for you, and I think this comment came in when you when you started talking about the first um, rain garden um, idea that we have in the guidance. That's, that's right. Um, well, the good thing about um, rain gardens is that they are kind of they are self-contained. So if there's any pollutants in that soil that need to be removed, or or they become silted up and they, they come reduced the capacity becomes reduced or whatever, you can effectively just scrape out all the soil and put new soil back in again. So it's an above surface treatment. And so from an access point of view, it's not actually a big deal. It's get an excavator in, excavate soil out, put new soil back in. But we haven't come across any schemes yet where that's actually occurred yet. Um, discussed, um, we've looked at various case studies, um, Grangetown in 
uh, Cardiff uh, springs to mind and they don't seem to have any problems with uh, silting up at the moment. And as we were saying, uh, the project that we um, we are currently progressing in Perth and King Rose Day will be a great way to test these kind of uh, issues and, and to answer these kind of questions because probably our maintenance team is you know interested in the same same thing. What will this mean in the next five, ten years? How much it is going to cost uh, and how much effort it will be to maintain these features? Okay, um, the next question um, is what about large scale greenfield sites that are master planned now for the next 30 years? We all know how difficult it is to retrofit sites, so why are, why are these areas now planned without decent sites and multifunctional green space? Um, that is a very good question and, and I don't think there is a really easy solution to that. Um, certainly when you have a site when you start to look at um, allocating it in a, in a local development plan because that's where most of these large-scale greenfield sites come from we also recognize that we need to look at closer um, of the drainage characteristics of that site and get these aspirations and opportunities in the local development plan as early on as possible and then stick to those requirements um, which is challenging, you know, as it is over a 30 year period, because that development will need to be project managed. Um, and obviously the developer will need to be on board with that. Um, so it is a massive challenge, but I think this is, this is where the joint commitment from all the stakeholders comes in. And, and that's, the, that's the only real way to make it happen. I would also say that it is um, more emphasis on looking at green infrastructure early on is hopefully coming in through the next national planning framework, which should give us um, a bit more opportunities, a bit more uh, policy background to build on. I don't know if anyone else would like to add to this one. I think that's a question I would love to ask planners, but I'm not, I'm not sure I'm allowed, to, I'm not allowed to ask questions today, am I? So um, I, I think you're kind of right. It, 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 we, the earlier you can get into or a build into an area which is due for for development, the idea that there is a there is the a, a proper way to manage the stormwater from the site. Uh, I, I think you, that has to be done. Uh, we are actually practicing that a little bit in some areas with some local authorities. So, so pre-developer being involved, pre-local development plan, uh, you know, a pre-appearance in the local development plan, we are thinking about, we can attach to that site some information about the requirements for managing stormwater. So that that site is is promoted, it is sold, it is purchased, it is developed, it is designed with stormwater management understanding in from the start. That, that that's that's what has to happen. Otherwise, we end up trying to fit it in round the roads and the buildings, and we end up effectively retrofitting, which uh, is much much harder prospect. Uh, if there's if there's one thing you cannot control entering your development boundary is the amount of rainfall in the future. Uh, so you, we better get used to starting to plan around that. Um, and I think that would be an appeal to everybody involved in planning is to start thinking about the water first before anything else first. Yeah, David, I, I definitely agree with you uh, on that. And, and from a planning perspective, what I would add as well is I think having that information is really, really important. Um, and we will be looking at ways of how we can get this uh, in Perth and Kinross Council, because obviously as a planning department, we, we are not engineers. We don't have, we uh, mm -hmm. don't necessarily have the budget to make those surveys happen at the right time, but we will have to look at how we can learn more about the site at LDP stage or pre-development uh, plan stage. So yeah, yeah definitely cool. agree mm -hmm. with you on that. Yeah. Um, okay, next question from uh, Sean. My question relates to the economic co-benefits of multifunctional water management sites areas. 
Have any of you given consideration or assessment of investment opportunities for local green enterprises to also use these spaces such as for local food production? Um, yes, uh, actually, as part of uh, the Dunkeld Road Corridor um, regeneration project, we are looking at how we could incorporate food growing areas um, into this scheme because we are also running a food growing strategy at the same time and creating more opportunities for locals um, to grow their food in an alternative way is another objective that we are looking at. Um, I don't know if anyone else can think of examples where food well, production could be incorporated. I mean, I don't think I'm not. Um, I don't know necessarily about food production, but I was just thinking about the, the example of uh, Grangetown in, in Cardiff there. And in that, in that situation, a lot of the lo local residents have taken almost ownership of their nearby uh, rain garden. And in many, many instances, they're growing some of their own plants there, which don't do any harm to the, the rain gardens. Um, but in some instances, um, some of the local residents have actually been growing, uh, I don't know, squashes like uh, pumpkins and the likes in the, in the rain gardens as well. So there may be sort of like more localised opportunities for that, like that. Yeah, thank you, Doug. Um... Moving on, hopefully that answered your question, uh, Sean. Moving on to the next one uh, from Helen. Currently being refused agreement for adoption of a such basin if there is any public access and if it is not fully fenced. Any advice? Hmm. I'm going to try and not get dragged into any specifics here, but uh, <laughs> I, I would say keep keep trying, keep asking. Um, I, I, I'm going to assume that you're talking about a site in Scotland uh, and you're talking about Scottish water, but uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not certain about that. Um, sounds unreasonable. I think there must be some justification on why it hasn't been adopted or um, being considered. Uh, it would be good to get uh, those, those views from whoever it is who's going to be adopting it. Yeah, yeah, it is. It sounds tricky without kind of knowing the details. Uh, yeah, but I yeah. hope I hope you will see it, Alan. Um, next question is around monitoring progress of the projects um, that Doug was talking about in his presentation. Um, I can talk about the last one, which is the Kinross Rain Gardens project. That's actually community led. So as a council, all we do um, is advise on this. And there's actually uh, uh, the community group that's taking this forward. They are the ones who are looking for the funding for this and putting, uh, basically we are just advising them how to put the necessary agreements into place. Um, so we don't we just have to keep up to date with what's happening there in terms of Dunkeld Road I don't know Doug do you want to comment on that? Yeah Dunkeld Road is still at early stages uh, of, of sort of concept the concepts there and it's we're at the point where the design team is being gathered so it's actually really really early stages so there isn't uh, an actual program as such that's been devised for it and um, also with integrating other projects into it as well. All the other projects have their own time scale um, and at some point they're all converged into one, one big project. Um, I believe that the, the funding though for Dunkeld Road is I think about four years. So sometime in the next four years we should have, have completions, but it'll probably be also developed in a section by section approach as well. So in a, in a phased approach. Uh, and that's that's all the information I have have available at the moment. Yeah, in in terms of the Kinross Rain Gardens project, so that's also um, very early stages, and I think um, you will see if you look online that the community group is trying to progress this quite fast and uh, have consultation with the locals of what they would like to see. So uh, keep an eye on on both projects, and I think there will be new information coming up soon. Um, 
I'm conscious of the time, so maybe just take one last question um, on peatlands. Suds across peatland is difficult due to the soil type. This makes up most of the de developed land in our local authority. Is rewatering of peatland being promoted? Is there guidance from Scottish Water of that in relation to adopted schemes? Wow. Um, I'm not sure that we have any view on, on I think you said dewatering of peatland. Um, is, is that right? Did I pick that up right? Watering. Well, right. I, I'm I, I'm not sure I can comment specifically on that that aspect. Um, I'm not sure if it's if it's much that we would get involved in because that's essentially the drainage of of land, which is not our our statutory responsibility. So this is perhaps one of the ones that we can uh, follow up and include an answer. Um, like for the next questions, which we unfortunately won't have time to go through. Um, so Doug and David and I will look through the remaining questions and we'll try to provide some answers so that you can look at those as well as the recording of the session afterwards. So I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up now, but thank you very much for uh, coming along. We had great attendance, around 80 people, and I hope you found the session useful and please, uh, a shared recording and uh, the Q&A as well with anyone else who may be interested. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.